You are listening to KLRN Radio, where liberty and reason still reign. KLRN Radio has advertising rates available. We have rates to fit almost any budget. Contact us at advertising at klrnradio.com. You're listening to the Spark Radio Network. Radio like you've never heard before. Innovation, creativity, and imagination are all said to begin with a spark. So fasten your seatbelt and take the ride of your life and listen for the spark. God's Pure Word of Faith with Richard Harden can now be heard Monday through Friday mornings at 7 a.m. Central, 8 Eastern, and on Saturday and Sunday mornings at 6 a.m. Central, 7 Eastern. Join him and let's turn our country back to God. It only takes a spark to start a forest fire. Let's get on fire for the Lord. Right here on KLRN Radio and the Spark Radio Network. Each of my programs are being saved so that you can listen to them at any time. There's just four simple steps to find the past programs. Go to www.spreaker.com. That's S-P-R-E-A-K-E-R dot com. Enter my name, Richard Harden, in the search box in the top center of the home page. Click on the brown icon, which has the Bible, two candlesticks, and a cross in the background. A list of my programs will come up. You're listening to God's Pure Word of Faith with Richard Harden. Richard will guide you through the Bible and help you find God's purpose for your life. Now here's teacher and author Richard Harden. Welcome to God's Pure Word of Faith. I'm Richard Harden, and again I want to thank the Lord and the management of KLRN Radio for this great opportunity to share God's Word with you today. I'm going to share with you about one of my favorite scriptures. <laughs> I guess I have a lot of them, but anyway, this one, Ephesians 2.8, where it says, For by grace are you saved through faith. Um, I've heard this since I was nine years old, living at the Baptist Children's Home. I've heard it so many times and everything. In fact, in those days, you know, even when I thought I was a Christian then and wasn't, I looked forward to the preachers preaching on that because I knew they wouldn't be shouting and hollering. And even back in those days, back in the 50s, even Baptist preachers shouted and hollered a lot. To run up and down the stage, pulpit. But I knew they wouldn't be making that much noise, and I'd be able to, you know, relax and maybe sleep a little bit. But anyway, today it's become one of my favorite scriptures for the truth of God's word that's in it. For by grace are you saved through faith. Now, one of the problems is that our spiritual leaders. I've, I've read to you many of the comments they've made in some of the previous broadcasts about the ministers and things like this, about grace and about faith. They just don't seem to understand the simplicity of what grace and faith are. If you try to look them up in the uh, theological dictionaries and all this stuff, you know, there's, there's such a confusion there or trying to, you know, be so technical and everything that they don't understand. But now the seriousness of it is, Without this understanding, what if they don't know and understand what grace and faith is? What would, you know, uh, well, it'd be like most people that talk about electricity. I'm an electrical engineer. I understand, you know, the definition of electricity and things like this and how to generate electricity and, you know, just a lot of specifics like that if electricity failed and everything. But most people are talking about electricity. Uh, when something fails or something, they say it's probably shorted out or it's you know, probably unplugged or you know some common expression like this they've heard, and they do not know really what it is that they're talking about. Um, we can talk a lot about electricity, you and I can, and, and many of you can operate these computers better than I can, <laughs> even though I'm an electrical engineer, and you can operate you know, your cell phones and all these things, and actually you can 
get more out of them and do more like this and, and you don't have any idea what the basic definition of electricity is and you don't need to. You know, you could just use it. See, but the problem is, though, when uh, people don't know and understand, like, the definition of electricity, they can make some uh, real weird or conflicting statements about it that could be confusing. And that's the way it is with faith and grace. Without knowing the true definition of faith and grace and, and where it comes from, how you get it and everything, uh, like I mentioned to you the other day, uh, this gentleman that's written 25, 30 books on grace and it's on, you know, the New York Times bestseller list and everything. In one of his most recent books, and about 15 uh, top leaders around the country and, and these, uh, you know, Christian organizations, uh, so many of them signed on to his book saying how great it was and how great it enlightened them and they got so much out of it and they learned so much about grace and everything but on page 10 of his book he says he has no tip on how you receive grace he says it just kind of gets you that is such a poor understanding of of not only just one of our leaders, the, the, the guy that's written the book, Max Licato, but of all those, you know, eight or ten or fifteen people that he got to sign on to the book, looks like one of them, if they understood what grace was, they would give him a tip on how you receive it. Now that that is so sad because without being able to understand these basic uh, words in our uh, Christian community and everything like faith and grace how would somebody know to respond to Ephesians 2 8 says for by grace are you saved through faith and they say well I sure would like to you know receive that grace and you know through faith and like that now what do I do and there's not a clear thing out there but I'm going to clear it up for you today if you continue to listen in I'm going to clear it up the simple definition of faith and grace the best definitions you can get are definitions from the Bible because see, they're biblical words, so if you can find some definitions or other scriptures that explain what these are, then that's the best ones you can get. But you go to these theological uh, dictionaries, and there'll be a half a page, and they'll be using every word in the Bible almost to describe something, try to. and Anyway, uh, but I'm going to clear it up for you today if you stick around. Now, our spiritual leaders are doing, you know, somehow or another, they're not doing it intentionally to confuse people and everything. It's just that when they say things like these trite statements of, you know, grace is God's unmerited favor, or grace is we get what we don't deserve, and mercy is when we don't get what we do deserve. Thanks. See, that doesn't explain what these words are and how they come alive in your life. They're just cute little statements that, you know, that people laugh at and, you know, clap and everything because they sound so good. But they don't do anything to, you know, to, to lift your spirit inside to let you know what grace, faith, and mercy, and things like this are. But you need to know. And, and it's simple enough that everybody can know. I have a, a bunch of videos on the, my, the link to from my website. And I've also got, this will be my 40th broadcast. With, they're being saved, and they're called podcasts and everything. And I'll tell you in just a minute how you can get to them and then we'll get to the details of the definition of these words and get it cleared up for you so you can receive the grace to faith today you can receive it during this program before we leave today and and you can have kind of the spiritual control of your life in turning to the Lord and and receiving faith and receiving grace things like this that that you need to know and have that good confidence because someday we're going to stand before the Lord and we need to have that confidence now that when we stand before him, we're going to have the true grace. We're going to have the true faith and that we're going to be doing what we need to be doing while we're here. But right now, listen, my website, I have the links to six books. Visit Richard's website at raharden.com. That's the World Wide Web at rahardin.com. At his website, you can see a summary of the six books he has written, where purchases may be made. 
He also has a link to 18 videos on YouTube and several blogs about Christian beliefs. If you prefer, visit Amazon.com backslash Kindle and type in Richard Harden to see and purchase his books. Yes, but so many people um, think that their preacher is the greatest preacher on earth, and that's good. You know, you probably wouldn't be in a church if you wouldn't. But pay attention to what they're saying. Pay attention. I've heard Dr. Dobson, you know, uh, one of the well-known men across our country, and um, Dr. Jesse Duplantis, Word of Faith movement, Dr. Hagee from down in San Antonio, Dr. Kennedy that's passed away now from the Presbyterian Church down in Florida, Dr. Price out on the West Coast, Dr. Schuler has passed away recently, Dr. Stanley, Kenneth Copeland, Benny Hinn, Pat Robertson, Andrew Warmick, T.D. Jakes, Hank Handegraaff, all these men. Now, I've, I'm not just saying this, but I've got it written down when they said it, you know, and what they said, and, you know, the different radio or television programs, things like this, that just show there's complete, complete confusion about these simple words that should be, you know, like kindergarten words to a Christian, like grace and faith. These should be some of the first words, you know, once a person becomes a Christian, they learn what these words are so they can go out and share with others that you receive it. But it's just creating more confusion or lack of knowledge and understanding of basic faith and grace uh, just causes these so much misunderstanding and confusion that, you know, today you can see from the decrease of Christian influence in our nation, people want to get rid of us Christians rather than to, uh, you know, turn, you know, for wisdom or turn for help or something during time of trouble. Uh, there's little no, noticeable response in our society of God backing up and honoring what our Christian community is doing. And, well, like Proverbs 35 and 6 says, Every word of God is pure, a shield them, put their trust in him. Add thou not to it, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. There's so much confusion in Christian community with the two or three hundred different denominations teaching and preaching different things and each one of them claiming to be inspired of God, you know, inspired, you know, Christian community and everything. Each one of them talking about faith and grace and, you know, Jesus and like this. And, but God doesn't seem to be backing it up in our society. The, the uh, Muslim influence and the ACLU influence in our country and everything like that. Every now and then we win a little victory, something like that. But it seems like in the majority of the case, Christians are just being pushed out and ignored in our schools and our government and everything like this. Now, uh, and this is why, because there's so many errors being taught in our society. But we got to start at the fundamentals. We got to start just salvation and how a person can can read this simple scripture, Ephesians two eight, say for by grace are you saved through faith. So first I'm going to start talking about faith, and then we'll get to grace. Now faith, one of the most common beliefs throughout the Christian denomination, is that God has blessed mankind with the definition of faith in Hebrews eleven one, which says now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. This would be great. This would be awesome if that were a definition of faith, but it is not. It talks about faith, and it's true, but it's not the definition of faith. Now, Hebrews 11, 1, quote above, says that when my hopes are being fulfilled or are fulfilled, I have the evidence that the unseen faith was the substance present and manifested in fulfilling my hopes, even though I couldn't see it. It only tells me how to recognize the manifestation of faith in my life, and and you know you can see why they would uh, the writer would put that first how to recognize the manifestation of faith in your life because Hebrews chapter 11 we call the faith chapter, it goes on to 30 30 something uh, scriptures telling about how faith was manifested in the lives of the great people of the Old Testament and everything and how they were manifested in you know the uh, uh, well just in how it would be manifest in our lives too, for an example now. But but that's not a definition of faith. It is true that you can recognize when you see your hopes being fulfilled, it's got to be faith, you know, the substance fulfilling your hope even though you can't see it. Now, for an example, let me give you another example then. Suppose I uh, put a windmill out in the field, or, you know, 
the blades turn, wind blow, turn the blades, and it generates electricity. That's my hope by putting that windmill out there that I'll have the wind uh, cause the blades turn, generate some electricity to help support my house or something. Okay, I could say wind is a substance fulfilling my hope to turn the windmill blades, which is the evidence of things unseen, the wind. See, uh, when I look out the window or look out in my front yard and I see those windmill blades turning, all I can tell from that is that there's movement of air through there causing those windmill blades to turn, even though I can't see the air. But I can say that air is being manifested or wind is being manifested there at the uh, windmill because the blades are turning. See, the fact that my hopes are being fulfilled and the blades are turning tells me that there's wind, air moving through, causing them to turn. I can't see the air, but I know it's there because the blades are turning. That's the way it is with faith. When I see my hopes being fulfilled, I can know that faith is doing it, even though I can't see the faith. But I can see my hopes being fulfilled. And that's what Hebrews 11 1 is. It's telling you that um, faith is a substance of things hoped for, a substance of fulfilling your hopes, even though you can't see it. Now, that's not a definition. If I tried to go to meteorology school and with a definition that uh, wind is a substance fulfilling my hopes to turn my windmill blades, I wouldn't get very far in class if I used that as a definition of wind. No, you've got to start talking about the movement of air and things like this and, and things to just see to get a definition because the definition is supposed to tell you what the substance is, not just talk about it. So Hebrews 11.1 1 is not the basic definition of uh, faith. And, and you'll hear these people or see them on TV or hear them on radio explaining how that's a definition. And they all come up with such, well, ridiculous definitions from that. And, uh, well, it's just no way you can come up with a definition of it because it's not a definition now. Uh, in faith, this, this erroneous definition with the many personal interpretations uh, of the different ministers across our country is what leads people into such a confused idea of what you must do or to receive faith or what you must do with faith. Now, you don't do things with faith. That's not a way of saying it when you hear and find out what faith is. It, you don't do something with it. Um, you do some things, but, but it's not worded correctly and causes confusion and everything. And God will not back up teachings that people have about faith in our Christian community if they're starting out with Hebrews 11 1 being a definition of faith because it'll be starting out with error right from the beginning. Now, uh, let me share with you what faith is and you'll see what I mean then of how that is such a confusion in our society. Now, Romans 10 17 says faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. So, there's not any two or three different kind of faith. There's not a, a, you know, Christian faith or a biblical faith, and there's not a, you know, a non-biblical faith or something like this. No, there's just a faith that comes from hearing from God's word, but only if you accept what you hear into your heart. Uh, Psalms 119:9 says, "Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way?" It says, "By taking heed thereto, according to God's word." See, if you don't take heed to it. And that's included in Romans chapter 10, verse 17, where it says faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God. And that hearing is a basic word, you know, root word, he. Um, hearing and heeding. <laughs> now, when God manifests himself to us in our minds or hearts to develop a message to us, you know, like we say, God spoke to me. Or, you know, uh, I was reading this scripture and it, just kind of lifted off the page and, and spoke to me and, and answered me. However God speaks to you, it is God himself coming to you. See, God and his word are one and the same. God speaks in his word. Christ goes forth. Uh, John chapter 1 verse 1 says, In the beginning was the word, and the word was God, and the word was God, and the word is God. God and his word are one and the same. So when he speaks to us, he doesn't just send us a teletype, Twix, or something like this, or text, it's himself manifesting his spirit in our minds or hearts 
forming what we call a message or something like this uh, and we say then that God has spoken to us well when he speaks to us then he certainly wants us to heed what he is doing or what he is uh, speaking to us in a positive manner now when he manifests himself in our minds and hearts to develop a message to us we must receive him his word into our hearts the spirit of his living word to become faith in us for those words to become faith to us if we reject him and his word it will be unbelief like uh, Hebrews chapter 3 verses 12 to 19 it says the children of Israel when they, entered, they got up to the promised land Jordan River they all knew it was God's will they knew his word it was his will for them to cross over in into the promised land cross over Jordan but they didn't trust him enough they didn't trust that he'd take care of them after seeing all those miracles in Egypt and all those miracles and feeding them and everything bringing them up to that point their their failure to trust him then got God so upset because if you see in Hebrews chapter 3 verses 12 through 19 it says um, that because of an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God see and that's what we do too if God asks you or me to teach a Sunday school class and we reject we're departing from the living God and telling him you know we don't want to do what you want us to do see we're rejecting him we're not just rejecting a wooing or or a good feeling to teach that class or something like that you know when when God calls you and, and leads you to that or to work with young people or to preach or whatever you know that is serious it's God the living God himself coming to you manifesting in your mind or heart to bring you to a knowledge that he wants you to do that and when you reject it then you're rejecting him and it says in Hebrews 3 let's see 19 they failed to enter in because of an evil heart of unbelief let's see it's when, when you're in doubt that's a hid knowledge you don't know God's will but when you come to a knowledge of God's will and God manifesting his will to you it's a heart problem then and when you reject that it's because of an evil heart of departing from the living God and rejecting him and his will and his desire for you or me that's how serious it is see to, so to receive faith then when we hear from God and he speaks to us the only way to receive faith is to receive his word into our heart like for example uh, Hebrews 4 2 it says for unto us was a gospel priest as well as unto them but the word now the word of the gospel you know the God of the gospel see God and his word are the same the God of the gospel manifesting himself to us uh, what he wants us to do in receiving him and everything but the word preached to them did not profit them not being mixed with faith in them that heard it so when God brought a knowledge of the gospel you know his living word to them and his living word and God are one and the same when he came to people and manifest himself and and told them what they need to do to be saved to turn to him with all their heart they didn't mix it with faith see they didn't accept him then into their mind and heart into their heart then so that he could perform the work of grace because see once we receive his spirit of his words and him into our heart now then see for by grace are you saved through faith through our faith of accepting him and his word his living word into our heart now he starts performing that work of grace in our heart like Ezekiel 36 26 one of the best definitions or not definition but it's one of the best descriptions of grace that I've found anywhere Ezekiel 36 26 where God says a new heart also will I give you see when he comes into our heart when we invite him in by faith and open our heart to him and receive the faith of his gospel his words he says a new heart also will I give you a new spirit will I put within you see he's gonna put his spirit in us a new spirit to us a new heart also will give you a new spirit will I put within you I'll take away the stony heart of your flesh I'll give you a heart of flesh and I'll put my spirit in you and when he puts his spirit in us he means he puts his spirit in us to live in us and we then are a child of God well like in the Galatians 4 6 and because your son's got to sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts crying Abba father wherefore you no more a servant but a son if a son then heir of God through Christ see when he when he comes into our heart when we open our heart which is called you know the faith accepting him and his words his messages uh, to us into our heart by faith 
then when he comes into our heart, he creates in us a new heart, gives us a you know a new spirit, puts his spirit in us, and now we're children of God. We're joint heirs with Jesus. And Romans 8 9 says, Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. See, so that's when we become a child of God, when his spirit comes in us. But now, Ephesians 2 8, for by grace are you saved through faith. See, through our faith, through our acceptance and responding to God when he brought this message of the gospel, the words to us, through our faith in of accepting and receiving those words into our heart, for by grace are you saved through faith. It's that grace in that saves us. So if when we call out to God for salvation, we ask forgiveness, invite him to come in, his response then is to put his spirit in us, to create in us. Now, I'll be right back in just a couple of minutes. You are listening to KLRN Radio, where liberty and reason still reign. KLRN Radio has advertising rates available. We have rates to fit almost any budget. Contact us at advertising at klrnradio.com. Visit Richard's website at raharden.com. That's the World Wide Web at rahardin.com. At his website, you can see a summary of the six books he has written, where purchases may be made. He also has a link to 18 videos on YouTube and several blogs about Christian beliefs. If you prefer, visit amazon.com backslash Kindle and type in Richard Harden to see and purchase his books. Each of my programs are being saved so that you can listen to them at any time. There's just four simple steps to find the past programs. Go to www.spreaker.com. That's S-P-R-E-A-K-E-R dot com. Enter my name, Richard Harden, in the search box in the top center of the home page. Click on the brown icon, which has the Bible, two candlesticks, and a cross in the background. A list of my programs will come up. That's what I want to share with you to see what this beautiful grace is that God has shared with us. Now, as I mentioned before, and it only comes to us in one way. There is something you must do to receive grace, and that is receive God's word into your heart for salvation. And what word is that? Like I mentioned a while ago, or read a while ago, it says in the scriptures, you know, that uh, the gospel priest, for unto us was the gospel priest as well as unto them, but the word, the word of the gospel being preached, the word, you know, where you receive it from just reading the scriptures yourself or however God speaks his word to you of the gospel, it's going to be about salvation. It's going to be about, you know, that we're all sinners. See, all that means is that we're all sinners is that we were born without the spirit of God in our heart. Sin is the separation of our heart from God. And every baby born on this earth is born without the Spirit of God in them. Only Jesus was born with the Spirit of God in him. And he was the Spirit was in him from the conception of his mother Mary, with the living word of God through that angel to Mary. She conceived then, and Jesus was born then with the Spirit of God already in him. Now, but all of us then, we are not born with the Spirit of God in us. As we grow up as a young person, then God starts teaching us that we're sinners, teaching us that, you know, Jesus answers. Romans 6, 23, um, I think what it says, that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And yes, some people are very good, you know, very good young people, you know, uh, even without the Spirit of Christ in them, you know, they have good morals. They've been taught by their moms and dads, you know, to treat others correctly and, you know, to, to not lie or cheat or steal. But see, that that's not salvation. 
their heart is still separated from God. As good as a person to be, look in Acts chapter 10, where it talks about Cornelius. It says he was a good man. He prayed always, gave alms. Him and his family was the most respected people in the community and everything. But God sent him a vision, and a, well, an angel in a vision, and said, go call after Simon. Peter's name was Simon, you know, the then. And he uh, said, go call after Simon. And he'll tell you what to do, what you need to do. Well, God gave Peter three visions because they didn't normally go to talk to Gentiles. Then. And um, so Peter had to be spoken to on the other end of that. And God gave him three visions and, and told him to go. And he went and told them about Jesus. And they all received Christ in their heart. Jesus, you know, spirit of Christ in their heart. And, uh, and that's what we have to do. See, I don't care how good you can be or how bad you are. There's enough grace when, if you will humble yourself and turn Ezekiel 33:11, God said, even back in the Old Testament day, He doesn't rejoice in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn and live. See, so it doesn't matter what our heart's like when we come to the Lord, but we have sin if we don't have His Spirit in us. So, for by grace are you saved through faith. You find out you're a sinner. You have your know, heart full of sin and things like this. And then you turn to the Lord and you call out to him and ask forgiveness of that sin. And invite him to come into your heart. And what happens then when you do that then is like I mentioned right before the break. Ezekiel 36, 26. A new heart also will I give you, the Lord says then. A new spirit will I put within you. I'll take away the stony heart out of your flesh. Give you a heart of flesh. And I'll put my spirit in you. See, we're all born into the family the same way. Now, we come to him different with different lives. And my wife shared how she was, you know, in a treatment center yesterday. And, uh, and she just called out, God, I want you more than anything and help, you know. She didn't know the fancy words of, you know, praise, faith, and all this. But like in Second Corinthians 3.16, it says, When the heart of man turns to the Lord, the veil of separation is lifted. When a heart just cries out to God, God loves to hear it, and he'll come in that heart, and he'll clean up the heart. Well, it says he'll take the heart out and put in a new, new heart, a new spirit, and his spirit in us. And then we're in the family of God, like Galatians 4, 6. And because your sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Daddy, Father, wherefore you are no more a servant but a son, if a son, then heir of God through Christ. See, when, when he sends the spirit of his son, then Christ, the living word Christ, the spirit of Jesus, into our heart, that's when we become a child of God. And see, we have to make that choice. And the reason it goes on to say in Ephesians 2, 8, for by grace you saved through faith, you know, it's, uh, let me see, let's see, Ephesians 2, 8, exactly how that's worded. For by grace you saved through faith, and it's not a, let's see, not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. Now, why it says it's a gift of God, it's not a gift like we think about Christmas gifts and things like this. It's a gift of God, because see, the people of the Old Testament had to do the same thing. If you look in, uh, let's see, what is it, Job, real quick, I find that. Job 33, 27. It tells what they had to do in those days to be right with God. And verse 27 says, and he, this is now in the Old Testament. He, God, looked upon men, and if any say, I have sinned, see, recognize their sin, confess their sin, and have perverted that which was right. See, I've, I've done a lot of perversion, you know, like that. And it profit me not. And then you recognize that that's not helping you any. You know, it's, it's, it's not profiting you a bit. You want out of it. You want away from it and everything. You want to turn from your sin. God will deliver his soul from going to the pit, and his life shall see the light. But see, now what happened here was they did that, and all they got was forgiveness of their sin until the next time they could go offer sacrifices. Their sins were covered then. And like this, First John 1, 9 says that if we will confess our sins, God is faithful and just. He will forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. See, that's why grace is called the gift. It's because when we turn to him and ask forgiveness of our sins and everything, like the people of the Old Testament did, ask forgiveness, confess our sin, say, I've perverted that which is right and everything. It doesn't stop there for us. He forgives our sins. And then like Ezekiel 36, 26 says, a new covenant, he says, and a new heart also will I give you. See, they didn't get the new heart in the Old Testament. 
when they got forgiveness of sin. They just got covering covering for their sins till the next sacrifices. Now, a, a new heart also will give you. A new spirit will I put within you. I'll take away the stony heart out of your flesh, give you a heart of flesh, and put my spirit in you. That is the gift, in a sense, that we're receiving that the people of the Old Testament didn't. That's why it's called a gift. We don't have to do any more to receive grace after we have asked God's forgiveness and invited Him to come into our heart. See, that's it. We ask forgiveness like they did, but when He comes in our heart, we get a lot more than they did. We get a total new relationship with God. We become His children. They didn't in the Old Testament. They were referred to as children of God sometimes and everything like that, but, but not like we are. We are children of God. Our eternal life starts the instant God's Spirit comes in us. Forty something years ago now, 41, in 1974, when I received the Spirit of Christ into my heart, I became a child of God throughout eternity. I'm His child now for the rest of eternity. See, and, and that's the gift it is talking about. For by grace are you saved through faith. And not of yourselves, but it's a gift of God. See, the, the, the grace, the creating the new heart and everything like that, he changed the new covenant because he wanted a closer relationship, a better relationship with us than he had with the people of the Old Testament. He decided to choose it. And that's why it's called a gift. It's not just a gift that he dumps on somebody here and somebody there like so many uh, people teaching grace seem to think it is. And no, grace is always the automatic response of us receiving God's word in our heart. Like now, I've been you know, a Christian 40-something years. If today God speaks to me about something, you know, just to go down to talk to a neighbor or to go do this or go do that, I've got to make a choice to accept what he says to me or reject. If I accept, then his words come in me alive, living words in me, and performs a work of grace in my heart to help me do whatever it is he's asked me to do. So I'm growing in faith and grace. I'm growing in faith because, you know, I've received more of his word in me. I'm growing in grace then because, you know, he's working his spirit in my heart to help me do whatever it is he's asked me to do. So... Grace is always the automatic response of us receiving God's word into our heart. And the scripture said, you know, God's going to bring everybody to a knowledge of him. In Romans chapter 1, verse 20, it says that we're all without excuse. And Titus 2, 11, the grace of God that bring us salvation appeared to all men. Well, the apostle Paul says, people that perish are those when they hear these great words of the gospel. Like it said in Hebrews 4, 2, For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them, but the word preached to them did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. Apostle Paul says in 2 Thessalonians 2, 10, he says, Those that perish are those that when they hear the word, refuse to receive the love of the word. You see, God is love. So when he comes to us and identifies himself to us and identifies it in a message in our minds and hearts, it's his love to us. And if we reject the love of the truth, we cannot be saved. The truth is God's word, so his word is love coming to us, drawing us to him. And that's all it means by grace. Now, I've heard, you know, it bothers me so many people don't like you to name names and everything, but I've heard uh, Dr. Stanley, Dr. Kennedy, it's passed on. Jesse Duplantis, Dr. Schuler, and Kenneth Copeland, Richard Roberts, Andrew Womack teaches there's two Gospels. Max Licato says, you know, he has no tip on how you can receive grace. Well, I'll tell you how you receive grace. Receive God's Word into your heart. Receive what he's asked you to do. And now revival would be, if he asked you to teach a class back there years ago and you don't, you humble yourself and say, Lord, I'll go teach now. I don't care where you want me to go teach. I'll go teach. I'm going to trust that you'll help me. See, the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. You know, whether you repent and turn to them and, and go back or not, they'll be waiting at the judgment seat of Christ if you don't fulfill them here. And if you don't humble yourself and and receive his words of instruction then. Like the Apostle Paul cried out three times, you know, to be delivered of his uh, thorn in the flesh. Well, if you look all through the Old Testament, there's about seven or eight times in the Old Testament, God evidently invented the words like that because he says, you know, if you don't kill out all those people when you enter the promised land, there'll be pricks in your eyes. There'll be, you know, pricks to your side. There'll be thorns in the flesh and like this. Those expressions were used 
mostly by God in the Old Testament telling the children of Israel if they didn't obey him and, and you know kill out all those evil people and destroy all those false gods and destroy all this said those people will be pricks in your eyes and thorns in your side the rest of your life and you know that's what happened they didn't they made leagues with them. they made covenants with them contracts with those people and everything and we're still suffering from that today we wouldn't have all the problems we have on this earth today if the children of Israel, had, when they moved in the promised land, had obeyed God's words and instructions. They were thorns in the flesh. Now, Apostle Paul, he was being persecuted. He was whipped three or four times, you know, with 39 stripes. He was, you know, beat up and left for dead. Well, he wasn't beat up. He was stoned and left for dead, completely left for dead. They, they knew in their hearts and minds he was dead, and they left him. See, that's how close he was to being dead. But it says in the next verse, the disciples came, stood around about him, and the next morning he was up on his way to preach and teach Christ Jesus and him crucified to people that had persecuted and tried to kill him. Now, but what was it in Jesus' answer? He says, my grace is sufficient for thee. That means when Paul asked to be delivered of these people that were persecuting him, all this stuff, like his thorns in the flesh coming at him from everywhere he went, Jesus said, my grace is sufficient. What he was saying was, my spirit is going to work in your heart so strong. You're going to love those people so much. You're going to want them to know about me and you're like this. That's what he was saying. And sure enough, when they left him stoned outside the city, look up those verses. I don't know exactly where they are now, somewhere in Second Corinthians. But anyway, he uh, was up the next morning on his way to go teach and preach Christ Jesus again. You know, because he wanted people to know. And, you know, that's the greatest thing any... Uh, anybody can do because you know what is there here on earth man I'm already far along like that I, I can see you know uh, it's not going to be long for me but I want as many of you people out there as possible to understand for by grace are you saved through faith today you can grow in faith by getting your Bible out and start studying and uh, well not that I have to study just start reading through it to enjoy between you and the Lord don't try to be a preacher just start reading your Bible and King James or whatever see as you read you say well I can't understand it read the parts you can't understand then that is no adultery no stealing no cheating no lying and all this stuff and if you don't understand something just keep on going because see it's not your job to have to understand it God's on the other end of those scriptures, and if you need to understand it, he'll give you understanding. Trust him enough that he, he knows what's in there, too, and that he'll explain it. He'll give it to you some way or another. But see, get your Bibles out. Start reading it. Proverbs, Psalms, Book of John, different things like this. But just read it to enjoy between you and the Lord, and it'll come alive to you. And that, that's what we need to do. And you can grow in faith as you're receiving those words there, where it says, go the extra mile, help your neighbor, you know, Pray for those that despitefully use you, you know, and, and things like this. As you start receiving those words in into your heart, uh, Philippians 2.14, you all things are complaining and arguing. That is so impossible to do, but yet we got to try to do it. We, and we catch ourselves arguing, complaining, and Lord, please help me. Please forgive me, you know, and, and get back on track. Help me to do that. And, you know, it even says we're not supposed to be offended. You know, you don't have to be offended when somebody says or does something to you. You know, it's got to where I feel sorry for people more than anything else now because of uh, people that will offend you. It's not God working through them. It's the devil working through them. And when they would offend you or something like that, just, just pray for them. Pray for them because God doesn't want them to do it to other people. He doesn't want to hurt others. And you're certainly in God's will when you're praying for somebody like that that has offended you, like an ex-husband, ex-wife, or you know, something like this. And so many people are so hurt in our society. But... They're being chained down. It's like a ball and chain because of their unforgiveness to those people in the past. In uh, 2 Corinthians 2, 10, 11, it says, Forgive others lest you give Satan an advantage. See, it's like a ball and chain, and the devil's got the advantage in your life. And, and as long as you're holding unforgiveness, it, like it says even in the Lord's Prayer, it says, Forgive others lest he won't forgive you. And not only that, when you pray it, it says, Forgive us our debts as we forgive others as we you know, forgive others their debts. See, and if you aren't doing that, you're praying right there for God not to, you know, <laughs> bless yourself if you're holding unforgiveness while you're praying that. So see, start reading the scriptures to enjoy between you and the Lord and you see something like that, like it says over in the book of James, it says pray for, you know, and the prayer of faith will heal the sick. 
It says call for the elders of the church. Like this, churches out there, start getting elders that will go out and preach and, you know, well, go out and share and pray with people. Because that's, in the book of James, it says verse 2. Okay, now, but, but all these people, one of the worst things that they're doing, unintentionally, they found this little, you know, uh, statement that sounds so cute. Grace is God's unmerited favor. Nothing you can do and, you know, uh, unearned, undeserved, and all this. And that pleases the devil so much for them to say that because, you know, grace is not God's unmerited favor. Unmerited favor is God's favor on lost people. Like it says in Romans chapter 2, verse 4, Or despise thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God or the favor of God leadeth thee to repentance. See, that's unmerited favor. People in a world of sin that have nothing to do, you know, like that. Uh, now, in the Old Testament, people, when they were serving God as best they could and everything, uh, God would not only bless them with all their, you know, uh, things they needed, but give them more blessings, and then yeah, there's favor to them and everything. But see, favor hasn't got anything to do with grace. Grace comes strictly from us bowing our knees to God's word, humbling ourselves to God's word and saying, Lord, please forgive me. Come into my heart and save me. I commit my life to you. See, there's no favor in that. There is something we have to do. They'll say, there's nothing you can do and all this. That's not true. You've got to humble yourself to God's word, your sinner, that Jesus is answered, and then not just know it in your head. See, for years I knew that in my head and thought I was a Christian. But I had never humbled myself and said, Lord, please forgive me. Come into my heart and save me. And I commit my life to you. That's a personal choice and commitment each one of us have to do. There is something you have to do for grace. You have to humble yourself to God's word and invite his word into your heart so that he can perform the work of grace. And that's just like as we walk as Christians, our daily walk of faith, when he asked me to teach a Sunday school class, I said, but I've never done it before. So many people are better qualified. And everybody almost starts out saying that. But you've got to trust God enough. Say, Lord, if you're asking me to teach, please help me. And I'll go and do the best I can. I'm going to trust that you'll help me. And you know what? It'll be great. Because, see, everybody's got to have a first time to teach. Everybody's got to have a first time to preach. You've got to have a first time to witness to somebody outside your church. Many of you listening probably have never told somebody at the service station or the grocery store or, you know, at a cafe or something like that that Jesus loves them or ask them, are you a Christian? And by that I mean, have you invited Christ to come into your heart and committed your life to him and like this? You've probably never had the nerve to say that. You need to get over that because, see, one of these days when we stand before the Lord, well, what is it, uh, Romans? Oh, Romans 11.30. Romans 11.30 says, uh, The fruit of the righteous tree of life, he that winneth souls is wise. Are there going to be any trees of righteousness, people in heaven because of what you've shared with them? And he that is wise winneth souls. You want wisdom? Start seeking and praying through the scriptures to help understand these words better so that you can then share with people. you can share with people about this great grace it's not God's unmerited favor that's speaking of mercy his mercy his love on lost people that you know they're even rejecting and, and maybe even cursing him and everything today so many in our society do but God still loves and bless them because he wants them to turn to him now Ephesians 2 8 again for by grace are you saved grace, the work of God's Spirit in our heart, creating us a new heart, a new life. It's salvation. Adopting us into the family of God. And in the book of James chapter 1, it says that it's like we're a, a limb broken off of another tree. But we're a limb engrafted into the family of God. See, now He is all of our substance. All of the needs we have and everything will be met through this new tree that we're engrafted into. Or like a vine, Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. We're engrafted into his vine. Now, he is our source. He is our life. 
Jesus said in John 6, 63, my words are spirit and they are life. See, uh, we don't live by bread alone, but every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God, his words are spirit and life to us. That That's where our substance, that's where our uh, life comes from in Jesus. We're all children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. By faith, and that means then that we've trusted that Jesus is God's son. We've trusted he died on the cross. He you know, did all these things for us. And then as a result of that then, we humble ourselves and turn to him and say, Lord Jesus, please come into my heart. Save me. I commit my life to you. Now, you want to grow in grace today? Start reading and study God's word and receive his word into your heart to faith. You'll be growing in faith as you're receiving new parts of God's word. Read some of those stories in the Old Testament. Some of them are so fantastic that, you know, just to show you a Jehoshaphat surrounded by three armies. Feared. The man of God feared. You've probably feared sometimes. But look at his response. He set himself to seek the Lord. He prayed. He fasted. God spoke to him and said, It's my battle, not yours. Just march out of the gate, set yourself, and see the victory. King David one time asked, uh, what do you want me to do? And God said, go over there and wait for the rustle of the mulberry bush. Then I will go before you. David had to tell all of his generals and everything like that. said, well, guys, we got to go over mulberry bush and wait until we hear the rustle of the mulberry bush. Then we can go, and God will go before us. Can you imagine what those generals thought when he told them that? But they did it. And they got the victory. On and on, throughout the scriptures, there's so many great stories like that to where we just trust God and he'll perform the victory. And and that's what he wants us to do. He wants us to seek him. He doesn't want us to go out fighting that. He doesn't want people today that will die for him. He died for us. He wants people that will live for him. He wants people that will receive his word in the heart and then just be crazy enough to go wait for the rustle of the mulberry bush or crazy enough to just march out in front of those three armies and set himself now see don't do that now unless you know that God's told you to when you know that God's told you to teach a class so trust that God will help you teach a class when you know he wants you to go down to the neighbor and share with them and pray with them and everything you know that he's going to go with you if you go with the right attitude so for by grace are you saved through faith you receive grace as a result, automatic result of your humbling yourself to God's word, inviting his word to come into your heart, then the word in your heart, the living word of God in your heart, then creates a work of grace in you. There is something you've got to do for grace. You've got to humble yourself to God's word and invite his living word into your heart. Obedience. Now I'm going to share a short message on uh Predestination, election, Calvinism from John 3.16. John 3.16.17 For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him, Jesus, should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Now my revision is this. For John 3.16 For God so loved the people of the world that he gave his only begotten son Jesus that Jesus should endure the loneliness, the suffering of the perfect walk of faith and the painful sufferings of his seven sprinklings of his blood on the cross by the crown of thorns, the plucking of his beard, the nails in his two feet, the nails in his two hands, and the terrible stripes on his back that Jesus would go through all this suffering God allowed these sufferings in his mercy so that all of God's already pre-elected and predestined people prior to birth to die and go to heaven, that they would actually die and go to heaven. That sounds so ridiculous. If only predestined or elected people prior to their birth go to heaven, then there would have been no need for the work and suffering of Jesus no one's destiny would or will ever be changed by Jesus suffering and death on the cross for our sins and salvation because everything required for our salvation would have already been done prior to our birth by God's act of electing and predestining us to heaven or hell before birth. 
after God has predestined us to heaven or hell, there would be no need or no more to be done in heaven and earth. It would already be finished before our birth. So what's happening here is the devil hates Jesus so much that he's come up with this Calvinist, devilish, deceived theology that would have us think that we're predestined or elected prior to birth to go to heaven or hell and that would make all the suffering and work of Jesus as our Savior totally unnecessary, totally worthless, and Jesus totally useless. For his life and death on the cross would not change anything prior to, you know, people dying and going to heaven or hell. Because it's already been done by God predestining and electing them to heaven or hell before we were born. See how ridiculous that is. Good day. God bless you. God. And you know, as Christians, we have a new heart from God and the Spirit of Christ, God's power in us. God is love, and His Spirit is in our hearts. In John, 1 John chapter 4, verse 18, it says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love, God, casts out fear, because fear is torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love or God yet. So in James 4, 7, the Scripture says, Submit therefore to God, or His Spirit in you, Resist the devil, fear, and he, the devil in fear, will flee from you. When you start getting apprehensive about something, like starting to fly or a storm coming, looking ahead at what might happen to you in your job, your health, don't just worry and think about these future events, or maybe something that you're even going through right now. Philippians 4, 6 says, When you start getting anxious, turn to God then, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be known to God. Your request and your concern to be known to God. Worrying won't help you one bit, but it will cause you to miss God's blessings to you during that time. So, choose, make the choice yourself to set yourself in submission to God in prayer, talking to God, and counting your blessings from past things, experiences with God. Then watch the devil and fear flee from you. Now, always let your anxiety be a red flag to remind you to pray. God loves you. He will hear you. And in First Colossians one twenty seven, Christ in us, our hope of glory. So have a good day. God bless you. And be set free. God's Pure Word of Faith with Richard Harden can now be heard Monday through Friday mornings at 7 a.m. Central, 8 Eastern, and on Saturday and Sunday mornings at 6 a.m. Central, 7 Eastern. Join him and let's turn our country back to God. It only takes a spark to start a forest fire. Let's get on fire for the Lord, right here on KLRN Radio and the Spark Radio Network. You're listening to the Spark Radio Network, radio like you've never heard before. Innovation, creativity, and imagination are all said to begin with a spark. So fasten your seatbelt and take the ride of your life and listen for the spark. You are listening to KLRN Radio, where liberty and reason still reign. KLRN Radio has advertising rates available. We have rates to fit almost any budget. Contact us at advertising at klrnradio.com. Visit Richard's website at raharden.com. That's the World Wide Web at rahardin.com. At his website, you can see a summary of the six books he has written, where purchases may be made. He also has a link to 18 videos on YouTube and several blogs about Christian beliefs. If you prefer, visit Amazon.com backslash Kindle and type in Richard Harden to see and purchase his books. 
Each of my programs are being saved so that you can listen to them at any time. There's just four simple steps to find the past programs. Go to www.spreaker.com. That's S-P-R-E-A-K-E-R.com. Enter my name, Richard Harden, in the search box in the top center of the home page. Click on the brown icon, which has the Bible, two candlesticks, and a cross in the background. A list of my programs will come up.